um, welcome to today's seminar on the origins and evolutions of the European communities, external relations. Um, this seminar is part of a series of initiatives sponsored by the Jean Monnet Lifelong Learning Program within the framework of the Jean Monnet teaching module that I coordinate with Juliana Lasky, who is not here, she's been abroad for a couple of months now, uh, but she's supported the initiative in the uh, administrative and scientific um, aspects and she gives us her best regards. And before starting, let me thank Campus di Forlì, Dipartimento di uh, Scienze Politiche e Sociali, Europe Dive, and especially Fabio Casini and Donna Mungelli for their support in organizing the conference. Um, special thanks to Giuliano Garavini, who has supported me even from New York in organizing the workshop. Um, thanks to the participants and the discussants for accepting the invitation. Um, and I think we can start with the first panel. Professor Lorenzo Mecchi could not make it in the end, so Giuliano Garavini is going to chair and present and discuss the papers. Thank you. Alessandra for having us and uh, um, what we will do is we have basically uh, if I'm not mistaken 15 or 20 minutes uh, at the maximum each uh, for this panel and I will just start uh, maybe in the order uh, here uh, with Davide uh, Denti who is a PhD candidate I don't know how far you are I'm from the first year. Yes, so, so he's in the first year of his PhD at the University uh, of Trento. So I guess he's finding his way in his uh, research. But today he's speaking to us about uh, the EU enlargement policy between domestic uh, and foreign policy, from membership rules to member state building. So without further ado, I give you, uh, you. the word. Uh, I don't know, maybe... No. Okay. Just okay. Thanks to the chair, thanks to Alessandro for organizing the panel and inviting me. I'll uh, take this time to uh, say a few things about how the enlargement policy of what is today the European Union got developed through the first two rounds of enlargement at the times of the community and how can different theories of integra uh, European integration help us explain different phases of uh, this development. Um, I'll have to be schematic to stay in time, so feel free afterwards to ask whichever, whichever uh, question. Okay, so um, let me start by saying that enlargement policy is a rather <coughs> peculiar policy in that on the, one side, on the one hand, it's an external policy aimed at framing the relations between the communities and selected for the countries which with an accession uh, perspective. But at the same time, it's a deeply constituent policy in that it aims at changing the number of the participants of integration and with that the nature of the project of integration itself. So it has been dubbed the best tool of European foreign policy. Well, for some it's also the only one if uh, as someone think that neighborhood and common foreign security policy are not uh, effective. This could be discussed, but it's not our uh, aim today. But its constituent and constitutive uh, features make it also uh, very relevant and uh, impacting uh, integration. In this uh, presentation, I will uh, show how a classic method of enlargement developed in the first two rounds of enlargement, complementing the thin provisions of a treaty, and how integration theories can help us explain this. But to start, from where did the communities begin to enlarge? In 1952 and 1957, when the first treaties were signed, only six states took part in integration. 
Why that? Well, we can say that other European states were either uninterested, constrained, or excluded. Among the uninterested or self-excluded countries in that moment, we can include the United Kingdom, who still thought of itself as a mediator between the Commonwealth, the United States, and continental Europe, but also Scandinavian countries, which were um, delving into Nordic cooperation, which they deemed more feasible, and even Portugal, which, as well as the United Kingdom, thought of itself as the hub of an Atlantic centered empire. Secondly, among the constrained countries, we have to take into account the impact of the Soviet Union both directly on Central and Eastern Europe and indirectly on neutral countries, Austria, Sweden, Finland, who couldn't afford jeopardizing their fragile neutrality, fragile security by cooperating with NATO member countries. And thirdly, among the excluded ones, we can see that few countries were actually interested in taking part in integration, in economic integration, but their participation was considered unfeasible. On the one hand, Spain had an uh, authoritarian regime, which uh, we'll see how, but was not considered uh, a possible partner. And Greece, though democratic at that moment, was considered too backward, too um, far away and overly involved in geopolitical issues concerning Cyprus, for instance. So, as we said, the six countries began with integration, and in the treaties, both the ECSC and the EEC treaty, one article was devoted to frame a possible uh, procedure for enlarging membership. And that procedure remained fairly consistent for four decades. It was only modified substantially with the Amsterdam and then with Lisbon. <coughs> it's a rather intergovernmental procedure, which uh, uh, it's in line with the customary law of the treaties, and foresee um, unanimity by member states in the Council, the ratifications, but also, and this is an interesting point from the start, a role for the Commission in giving an opinion on the application. So, to go with the first round, we see in 1973, first countries, three countries, acceding the communities. This came after a rather long process, as from the start, in 1957, the British border trade began to see European continental economic integration as a possible threat to British trade, and to devise countermeasures. First, they proposed a Europe-wide free trade area, but this soon collapsed, and then they moved on to devise the European Free Trade Association between the so-called Outer Seven. So EFTA, EFTA was considered as a less, commissive, less committing option for these countries, but mm, after a few years, already in 1962, the economic data was, seeing, was showing that uh, it was way less successful than uh, the European communities in fostering economic growth. Thus, in 19, we have in 1961 the first application by the United Kingdom, which triggered the same move from Ireland and from Denmark. We could uh, delve a bit more on this, but I have to go forward. And I'll just say that... Um, after the two French vetoes, finally, these countries uh, uh, acceded the Union in 1973. The accession process developed through a conference with uh, higher involvement of the communities that was actually foreseen by the treaties. So it was the Council, which conducted negotiations, and the, communion, uh, the Commission, which gave an early opinion and the final one. And in this process, one fundamental principle was set, which was the non-negotiability of the acquis. What had been established earlier could not be undo or renegotiated in the moment in which further states, further countries set to accede to the communities. Only eventually temporary delegations were possible. So to sum up the first round, we can say that it was mainly more, um, 
uh, fostered by economic motives uh, in the sense of fear of losing markets by both the United Kingdom and Ireland and Denmark, and that it set uh, the first fundamental principles beyond the letter of the treaties. The second round of accession of enlargement in 1981-86 was rather different. On the one side, um, well, it was actually fostered by an exogenous change, which was the fall of authoritarian regimes in Mediterranean countries, and it was less linked than to economic uh, motives. In fact, all the three countries, in other three countries, Spain, Portugal, and Greece, newly established democratic regimes turned to the European community countries in order to establish legitimacy for the, for, uh, the, the still shaky democracies. And on the other side, the Union as well had the um, motivation of anchoring them, both in that they were anyway NATO countries and in that they were to become democracies and with, that, with this also in large markets. What can we say then out of these first two rounds is that what was later dubbed by uh, Preston in 1985 as a classic method of enlargement was developed in order to complement uh, the thin provisions of the treaty, which some other authors, Cameron and Avery, had um, defined as an imperfect guide to enlargement. It remained uh, uh, a case-by-case -case, uh, process through discrete episodes and ad hoc bargaining. And nevertheless, it uh, achieved the objective of doubling the size of the community. Some fundamental principles were set, starting with the fact that the key had to be transferred in full to new member countries who could only negotiate about timing, delegations, and uh, technicalities, and that the Union would rather uh, adapt incrementally <coughs> and commit to a further fundamental reform to be achieved in a second moment. How do, and I'll go with the second part, how do the theories of European integration help us explain the different phases of this process? I'll take a three theories into consideration. I'll have to be really sketchy, but I'll just say that um, liberal intergovernmentalism, neo-functionalism, and social constructivism can help us see, um, can help us make sense of different things in the enlargement process. Liberal intergovernmentalism as a liberal theory of the formation of state <coughs> references coupled with an intergovernmental theory of bargaining among member states is well versed to help us explain the outcome of the accession negotiation. It's a theory that takes member states as central actors, as, guardian, as masters of the treaties and gatekeepers of integration. The two points that liberal intergovernmentalism help us explain the best about enlargement are the fact that uh, have a distribution of the preferences among member states towards enlargement. So we have some brakemen and some other states which on the other side are drivers of enlargement. And their position is linked to their expected economic costs and benefits of an enlarged union. Secondly, it, liberal intergovernmentalism helps us explain the fact that uh, applicant states, candidate countries are in an assignated position towards incumbents and are ready to accept limitations, derogations, transitory periods, because for them the aim is to accede. That's a larger gain which allows them to accept, to accept limit costs and limitations. What it cannot help us to explain on the other side is why is enlargement uh, proposed on the first hand? Why shouldn't member states just stop applicants at the stage of an association, thus reaping economic benefits of trade integration, but not allowing them to have a say in policy making? Well, if liberal intergovernmentalists have to face this question, they have to refer to arguments with a different political base, shifting uh, towards uh, social constructivism. 
And secondly, it doesn't help us explain why some countries, especially the small, trade-dependent, industrialized ones, Sweden, Austria, uh, Switzerland, which would be perfect candidates for the integration and early integration, actually they refrain, they remain awkward toward the integration. Why do they? Do? We cannot explain it with this theory. The second theory they take into consideration is neo-functionalism, <coughs> which mm, shares some assumptions with uh, liberal intergovernmentalism. It's actually an earlier theory. And the, dif the main difference is that it gives primacy to non-state actors, both at national and at supranational level. And it sees a compelling drive on integration through the dynamic logic of spillover. So the fact that once, sector, once, once some sectors are, integ are integrated, they will provoke contradictions which will only be solved by for further integration. And probably Simone will say more about this dynamic later. Um, how does this help us explain some aspects of enlargement? Well, firstly, it can give us a sense of the demand for enlargement. So why do states want to take part in an economic uh, integration? Uh, what the theory says, tells us, is that economic integration has a magnetic effect, and states who uh, are faced with integration of their neighbors face raising costs of being excluded. And they can only overcome this by taking part in integration. Secondly, it tells us something about the role of non-state actors at both supranational and national level, explaining, tell, explaining us why the Commission was so much involved from the start in what by the Black Letter of the Treaty was an um, intergovernmental uh, process of um, interstate bargaining, even beyond the institution. And well, the theory tells us about this, but institutions, once established, acquire some uh, autonomy over time from their principles, and they become a driver of integration themselves. Thirdly, it tells us uh, why domestic level non-state actors get involved. For instance, we can see this in the uh, lobbying by groups such as the European Roundtable of Industrialists for foster enlargement uh, in, the, um, in order to achieve an enlargement of the market. And finally, it uh, helps us making sense of the functional relation between enlargement in the sense of widening and integration in the sense of deepening. Enlargement is something which also uh, creates contradictions creates need for adjustment and adaptation of both the institutions, the domestic, uh, yeah, the domestic uh, uh, mechanism of uh, relating with the communities, and thus fosters reform, helps us the commu help the community to foster reform. Not only actually on the mere uh, policy making level, but even on the identity level. We, see, we can see this in the um, example of the early Spanish candidacy of 1962, which was considered not that problematic by the institution themselves, but who fosters, who fostered a reaction by the civil society, by groups, by federalists, for instance, who opposed integration of Spain in that moment. Uh, I conclude only by saying that social constructivism help us explain those two things which liberal intergovernmentalism couldn't, which is why is enlargement an offer, and that is because, according to social constructivists, the union being a community of liberal states feels a normative obligation to open up to states with the same identity. And it also tell us, help us explain why some countries refrain from integration by referring again to ideational and immaterial factors to their identity as an independent variable. Thank you so much, and uh, I leave the word to my colleagues.
Thank you. And now we <laughs> shift uh, uh, from uh, a PhD candidate to an experienced uh, uh, researcher, uh, Simone Paoli, who was also the first person I met when I started uh, uh, dealing with the university. And uh, he wrote uh, mm, his first book basically on the history of European education policy. His book is called uh, Il Sogno di Erasmo, uh, which actually, if you're interested in knowing how the Erasmus program came about, you could read with profit. Uh, and uh, uh, is now researching on uh, migra the European migration policy, uh, and in particular also on the, what is, he's actually talking about today, which is uh, the birth of uh, the Schengen Agreement. So everybody knows what the Schengen Agreement is, uh, people moving freely from one European country to the other with, without a passport. What he's actually going to tell us about is the origins of this agreement. If you will, he's going to speak about the origins, at least how I took it, of the idea of a fortress uh, Europe, which you hear many times in the newspaper. So, Simone. Thank you, Giuliano. And uh, I read uh, as well for reading, but uh, I think it's better for, for me and, uh, and for you, even if uh, it will appear even more boring when, when it's really uh, his. Uh, as uh, Giuliano said, uh, I speak about the uh, origins of uh, the Schengen Agreement uh, and uh, so this paper aims at reconstructing the birth of the Schengen system between 1985 and 1990. Paying, obviously, uh, due to the, to the topic of this conference, uh, particular attention to its implications for the external relations of the European community and its member states. Uh, what is, what are the interpretations uh, of the Schengen Agreement? I think that the mainstream way of thinking about the emergence of Schengen is provided by the brilliant Milward's disciple. Milward is uh, probably uh, the most important scholar uh, of uh, the European integration process. The name of, the, of this uh, disciple, Milward, is Andrew Moravijic, professor of politics and director of the European Union program at the Princeton University. In his economistic perspective, Schengen emerged because France and West Germany, worried about each other's growing protectionist stance, pressed for a bilateral arrangement to simplify and eventually abolish border controls on persons. This decision related to the parallel decision to establish a European common market at community level was in turn part of a strategic game in which France and West Germany used the Schengen Initiative as a third as a threat of a two-tier Europe, a threat mainly directed towards the United Kingdom, unwilling to establish a common travel area with the continental community countries. This interpretation gets an important point, but it is my contention that it is not able to offer a compelling account of the emergence of the Schengen regime. The gist of my argument is that political considerations were more important than economic factors in the decision to sign the Schengen Agreement in 1985 and the Convention implementing the Schengen Agreement in 1990, and that the strengthening of external border controls rather than relaxation and eventual abolition of internal border controls was the primary motive behind these accords. In this sense, the Schengen Agreements are to be interpreted primarily in terms of foreign policy, since they were first and foremost political acts directed at promoting the geopolitical core of the European, uh, protecting the geopolitical core of the European community from a security threat and wanting mass immigration, especially from Mediterranean countries. Moreover, I argue that the decision to act outside the context of the European community was not primarily intended to put pressure on Great Britain, but to exclude the institutions of the European community from the decision-making process on immigration and more than this, to blackmail Rome, Madrid, and to a lesser extent Athens and Lisbon, interdicting their immigration policies to the more restrictive ones of Paris and Bonn. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, as it's well known since the early, and especially... <laughs> Uh, 
As is well known, since the hurling, especially mid-50s, all the member states of the European community, apart from Italy, experienced mass immigration, largely in response to the pool of high-growth economies, which desperately needed cheap labor from poor countries or periphery, especially in the Mediterranean region. This economically beneficial movement of labor from south to north was in keeping with the liberal spirit of the emerging global economy. Under the Bretton Woods system, international institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and the World Bank, as well as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, were set up to encourage and promote international exchange, including trade, foreign investment, and, if necessary, to maintain high non-inflationary rates of economic growth, labor migration. But what started as an apparently efficient transfer of labor from poor countries in the south to richer countries in the north became a political, social, and economic liability as growth rates slowed and anti-Arab sentiments increased largely in consequence of the 1973 oil shock. This led all the receiving member states of the European community to encourage voluntary repatriation of, immig of immigrants and to stop immigration, or at least to stop the recruitment of foreign workers. In exchange, efforts were stepped up to incorporate foreigners to resettle in the host societies. And this is the other part of the title of my paper. Why uh, did these policies fail? At the same time, demand pool forces were rapidly giving way to supply push forces in non-petroleum producing countries in the south, as their populations began to grow at rapid pace and their economies began to weaken. In addition, the struggle to win civil and social rights for marginal groups, including ethnic minorities and foreigners, <laughs> and the institutionalization of these rights in the jurisprudence of liberal republican states made it impossible for receiving countries in Western Europe simply to militarize their borders or to expel or deport unwanted migrants. Inadvertently, the result of trying to slam the front door of legal immigration shut thus led to the opening of side doors and windows, especially family reunification, illegal immigration, and false refugee claim. The perceived failure of national policies and the respective strength of constitutional, social, and political obstacles to the adoption of restrictive policies at national level led a group of members of the European community to look for a Europe-wide solution to the problem of immigration control. After a series of agreements in which President, French President Francois Mitterrand and German Chancellor Emmu Kohl formalized their commitment to gradually abolish controls of their common frontiers, the French Foreign Minister Roland Dumas and the German Anti Secretary to the Chancellor Waldemar Jrek Berger signed the Saarbrücken Accord on July 13, 1984. The agreement envisioned the immediate abolition of control of persons and the easing of control of vehicles. On the other hand, it envisioned the transfer of these controls to external borders, the harmonization of these policies and the legislation on foreigners, drugs, arms and passport delivery, and the strengthening of police and customs cooperation. As shown by Mitterrand documents found in the French National Archives, the main hope was that together France and West Germany might be able to accomplish what they have been unable to accomplish alone. Stop or at least contain immigration. A common solution could also help the states to mask the painful moral and political dilemmas involved in limiting immigration and the right to asylum. Soon after the signature of the Saarbrücken Accord, the Benelux countries began to show interest in the project. And at the conclusion of brief negotiations, the French Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Catherine Lalumière, the German and the Secretary to the Chancellor, Waldemar Schreck Berger, the Dutch Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Willem Frederick van Ekelen, the Belgian Secretary of State for European Affairs, Paul Paul, <laughs> the Kesmacher, and the Luxembourg Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Robert Goebbels, signed the so-called Schengen Agreement on June 14, 1985. 
modeled on the Sabrukan Accord, this agreement provided for the removal of internal border controls, while simultaneously introducing measures to strengthen external border controls and to fight against drug trafficking, international crime and illegal immigration. Apart from Great Britain, Ireland, Denmark and Greece, for different reasons opposed to stop short controls at the internal borders and transfer them to external borders, Italy was the great absent from the Schengen Agreement. The question of the inclusion of Italy in later Spain was at the core of the difficult negotiations leading up to the signing of the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement concluded five years later. The original group of Schengen members, in fact, included countries that had the will and the capacity to effectively manage their own borders with non-Schengen countries, since once a person entered the Schengen area, he or she could freely move across internal borders. In the mid-80s, Italy lacked both will and capacity, and this largely explains why it was not included in the original group. In particular, as shown by Mitterrand documents, Italian foreign ministry documents found in the Craxi archive and Schengen Executive Committee documents found in the archives of the Council of the European Union, the main source of this agreement was over the harmonization of these policies. While Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Belgium, West Germany and above all France considered these as a key instrument of their respective immigration policies and consequently strongly supported the idea of imposing visas on all risky countries, Italy did not request visas for citizens of a great number of sending countries, especially in the Mediterranean region, and obstinately refused to reverse this decision. The underlying motives concerned the need to facilitate tourism and pilgrimage, but more than this, the strategic aim of preserving its traditional close relations with Maghreb countries and Turkey. According to Italy, particularly under the premiership of Bettino Craxi, containment and reduction of immigration should not be pursued at the cost of a deterioration in relations with the, between the European community and its members and third Mediterranean countries. On the contrary, according to Rome, restrictive immigration policies at European level should be integrated and eventually substituted with the rational strategy of acceptance of the significant part of the Arab and Turkish labor surplus and the plan of economic assistance aimed at reducing socio-economic disparities between the two shores of the Mediterranean Sea. This diplomatic offensive culminated in the Mediterranean Conference on Labor Market Policies, which was held in Tunis in 1987 on suggestion of the Italian Labor and Social Affairs Minister Gianni De Michelis. Speaking in front of representatives from France, Greece, Spain, Algeria, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, Turkey and Yugoslavia, plus from the Arab League, the Arab Labor Organization and the International Labor Organization, uh, in addition also the European Community, De Michelis made an effort to reply to the fortress Europe logic according to him implicit in the Schengen approach by proposing the establishment of an integrated Euro-Mediterranean labor market and the launch of measures of economic and social cohesion not only at European level but at, at Euro-Mediterranean level. In his opinion this was the best way for the European community to contribute to development and stabilization of the Mediterranean region thereby simultaneously reducing immigration pressure on Western European countries. In the meantime, Spain, under the premiership of Felipe González, opposed, for similar reasons, the request to introduce visas for Maghreb and South American countries. Both Paris and Bonn, however, stood against the proposals of relaxing Schengen immigration rules and refused the idea of linking the strengthening of external border controls to the adoption of assistance policies for third Mediterranean countries. The airline remained that the members of the future Schengen area should cooperate in drastically reducing migratory flows through the construction of the ring fence around the common territory. In this context, the introduction of visa requirements for nationals of all countries deemed to be pressured to emigrate countries or producers 
of asylum seekers remain the core of the strategy and the fundamental condition for acceptance into the Schengen Club. The southern members of the European community, especially Italy, were left without alternatives. If they wanted to join the Schengen area, they had to impose visas for all the countries featuring in the Schengen Black List including the traditional allies in the Mediterranean Sea, in the Mediterranean region, and Latin America. As a response between the late 1989 and the early 1990, the Vice President of the Italian Council of Ministers, Claudio Martelli, went as far as to publicly oppose Italy's entry into the Schengen area, and to denounce the Schengen Agreement as a breach in the pro-Third World foreign policy of the European community, and as a blow to the Mediterranean policy of Italy, at that moment particularly concerned with the establishment of a special relationship with Ben Ali's Tunisia and the formation and development of the Arab Maghreb Union. In the meantime, an exception was instead made at the request of one of the founding member states of the Schengen region, West Germany. In the, the same period, eh? after the removal of Hungary border fence with Austria on May 2, 1989, and the consequent overwhelming emigration of East Germans to Austria and thence to West Germany, the Federal Minister of the Interior, Wolfgang Schuble, asked his colleagues in Paris, Brussels, The Hague and Luxembourg to abolish visas for Hungary. Facing the refusal of Paris to accept this request, on December 14, 1989, Bonn resolved to interrupt negotiations on the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement. After that, the federal government set the conditions for West Germany's re-entry into the negotiations. First, abolition of visas for Hungary and Czechoslovakia in the perspective of abolishing visas for as many members of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe as possible. Second, the facto inclusion of the Democratic Republic of Germany in the Schengen area in the perspective of the German reunification. At the conclusion of a dramatic internal debate, the government in Paris decided to accept both of these requests and to give to Germany what had been denied to both Spain and Italy. That is to say, the exclusion of friend countries from the Schengen Black List. As a consequence of this decision, to which Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg promptly agreed, German representatives rejoined negotiations and on June 19, 1990, the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement was finally signed. The convention contained detailed provisions which provided the legal base for implementing the general principles set out in the 1985 Schengen Agreement. The Convention decided for the removal of internal border controls and the transfer of controls to, ex to the external borders of the Schengen area. On the other hand, it included wide-range compensatory measures covering police cooperation and restrictive rules on asylum, border controls and visa policy. In exchange for Germany's support to the principle of harmonization of visa policies and in general to the establishment of the Schengen regime, France, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg accepted to exclude Hungary and Czechoslovakia from the Schengen Black List and to state that, I quote, the German Democratic Republic is not a foreign country in relation to the Federal Republic of Germany. So, de facto, admitting East Germany into the Schengen area uh, before the German reunification. Between 1990 and 1992, all the southern members of the European community, including Italy and Spain, signed the convention implementing the Schengen Agreement. To this end, they adhered to the conditions imposed to join the Schengen Group, not least the introduction of compulsory visas for people coming from the Mediterranean region and South America. And they conclude, in a sense, this outcome represented a symbol and a symptom of a more general eastward shift in the foreign policy of the European community, a shift 
which became evident in the next two decades, in the last two decades. Thank you for your attention. Okay, in fact, that there is some coherence to this uh, panel. Rarely this happens, but in this case, in fact, uh, it happened. And uh, to me, the coherence is that it's a panel about enlargement, but also focus on the losers of enlargement, because enlargement process is normally seen as something uh, that has only winners, <coughs> the, the countries that manage to become members of the European Union. But by enlarging the European community and then the European Union, also, if you will, created its own victims of the countries that did not become uh, members of the European community. Uh, and in a way, uh, Ivan uh, Obadic, Obadic, Ivan Obadic, uh, <coughs> who is a PhD candidate at the European University Institute in Florence, but has traveled <coughs> quite a lot from the University of Zagreb to London School of Economics, so he's well traveled. Uh, is going to speak, from what I understand, about, if you will, a loser uh, of the uh, enlargement process of the European community, and that is uh, former uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, his uh, presentation is called European Community, Britain and Yugoslavia in the Cold War in the Pursuit of Stability. Yes, question mark. Question mark. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I must first start with 1991 and with the historiographer overview because the Yugoslav uh, long lasting economic and political crisis came to its violent end in 1991. However, uh, the wars of succession, ethnic hatred, and the atrocities that followed the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, generated num numerous studies and, uh, in social sciences and humanities. And though... Is it working? Yeah, yeah. Keep it okay. close to your mouth. Uh, I hope you will make it better now. So, and though the Yugoslav crisis is even now quite a recent historical event for which uh, archival sources are not yet accessible, historians gave as well their contribution to this emerging body of literature. However, the historiography on the relations between Yugoslavia and the European community is in one way partial, since it is, it is almost completely focused on the policy of the European community and the European Union toward the region. Also, it is very narrow, because until up to, ta up to today, it, it is mostly focused on the uh, time period from 1991 onwards. Uh, in 2004, Birma noted, quote, that almost all the publications up until today start essentially with the visits of April, May in 1991, as if nothing had happened before, end of quote. Uh, this is now changing and I'm really happy that my colleague Benedetto Zakaria is also here since we are both dealing with this topic. Um, Benedetto is going to talk about the European community uh, towards Yugoslavia. Therefore, I will focus on two sides. First, I would like to focus on the Yugoslav policy towards the community, so we can gain the comprehensive picture of this relationship. And the second issue I would like to focus is the British policy towards Yugoslavia and why the Brit British officials uh, uh, wanted to, um, to apply the community economic and financial instruments in Yugoslavia in order to preserve the stability uh, of the country. Uh, first, I will talk about the Yugoslav policy towards the European Economic Community. Uh, the position of Yugoslavia in the Cold War divided Europe uh, was highly sensitive since Yugoslavia was in a quite unique situation as one of the two communist countries outside the Warsaw Pact. In such circumstances, Yugoslavia could only pursue the middle way as the Commun Communist Party had no aspiration and capability to definitely pass over to the western side and neither could or would like to return back to the east. Instead, instead, after the normalization of relations uh, with Moscow in the mid-1950s, Belgrade had embraced the policy of equidistance between the two blocs. 
Another distinctive feature of the Yugoslav foreign policy was the nine alignment policy uh, which was formulated in the second half of the 1950s and in the early 1960s. Until the end of the Cold War, Yugoslavia managed to keep more or less independent position in relations with the Western and Eastern Bloc, even though Belgrade in some periods became more aligned with one of the Cold War rivals. The concept of Yugoslav policy towards the community was based primarily on economic reasons. Until the early 1960s, Yugoslavia had experienced impressive economic growth with the significant financial help of the United States. At that time, Yugoslav ruling circles considered that Yugoslavia, as a response to the creation of the regional economic blocs, should promote economic ties with other non-aligned countries. This strategy, aimed at preserving economic independence, failed as the relative increase of Yugoslav trade with the, world, uh, with the third world countries during the 1960s was disappointingly small. In fact, the volume of trade mostly increased with EEC member countries who were, who were Yugoslavia's major foreign trade partners, in particular West Germany and Italy. The Belgrade dominant concerns in trade with the community were the endemic trade and balance of payment deficit. This was not surprising since Yugoslavia as a medium, a medium developed country imported from developed EEC countries in the industrial goods, mostly expensive capital equipment. On the other hand, Yugoslav major export products to the EEC were agricultural goods and raw materials. Therefore, the Yugoslav government viewed the creation of common agriculture policy in 1962 as a serious threat to Yugoslav economy. Additionally, the Yugoslav export, exports to the EEC faced the prospect of future further discrimination when the EEC set a common external tariff in 1968. In 1965, the Yugoslav government, government implemented the new economic reform to deal with the inefficient economy and growing trade deficit. In order to do so, the, the reform aimed to create a more productive, market-oriented economy. This, this transition to market socialism was interdependent with Yugoslavia's integration in the world economy. The way to achieve economic integration with the inter international markets was, on the one hand, to encourage direct foreign private investments, while on the other hand, to establish closer trade relations with the regional economic blocs. Yugoslavia's eagerness to seek trade agreement with the EEC, which would promote economic cooperation and liberalization of trade, especially the adjustment of the EEC external tariffs on Yugoslav agriculture <coughs> products, was reinforced by stagnation, stagnation, rising unemployment, and other economic difficulties which followed in the period immediately after the introduction of reform. The Belgrade policy decision makers believed that close economic cooperation with Yugoslav's largest tra trading partner would resolve some of the fundamental problems of the Yugoslav economy, especially the problem of effective, effectiveness or productivity and trade and balance of payments deficit. This was not just an economic problem, but the polit political issue of the paramount importance for the stability of the country. However, the, expect the expectations of the Yugoslav side were not fulfilled. Indeed, the trade deficit during the 1970s rose even more. Certainly, the EEC protectionist policies in the 1970s in part contrib contributed to the rise of Yugoslav trade deficit, yet benefits provided by the EEC to Yugoslavia were significant, and they could have enabled further development of the Yugoslav economy. The main problem, however, was the structural maladjustment of the Yugoslav economy, which became clearly evident from the early 1980s. The reason for the failure of Yugoslav foreign trade policy was in part the consequence of the general economic policy adopted since the mid-1970s. After the purge of the liberal leaders of the Communist Party in 1971-1972, the Yugoslav political leadership based their economic strategy on heavy borrowing and politically motivated investment, which created a highly bureaucratic bureaucratized and inefficient economic system. So, uh, now I would like to refer to the British policy uh, and the British view of the sit internal situation in Yugoslavia and also the impact of the Prague Spring uh, in 1968. So, in spite of the fact that the relaxation of the Cold War tensions, tensions in Europe in the 1960s made the position of Yugoslavia more reliable, the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia in 1968 raised concerns in the West about the Soviet threat to Yugoslavia and Romania. The Western policy makers were aware that the Soviet invasion of Yugoslavia would change the balance of power in Europe. 
and make the strategic, military and naval situation in the whole Eastern Mediterranean highly vulnerable for NATO alliance since Greece, Turkey and Italy would find, find them in an especially difficult situation. Furthermore, the British Foreign Office analysis from the early 1970s about the effects of the possible Soviet domination of Yugoslavia emphasized the serious political consequences this would have for the Western bloc since the Western failure to preserve Yugoslavia's status would cast doubts on the effectiveness of NATO and on the American determination to maintain the balance of power in Europe. Although the Western governments early came to the conclusion that the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia was designed to maintain the status quo, and that, quote, it appears highly doubtful that the Soviet will take the enormous risk of invading Yugoslavia for the questionable gains that would be achieved, end of quote, the Soviet trade to Yugoslavia in 1968 gave a new impetus to the Western policy towards Yugoslavia since this crisis reiterated the importance of Yugoslavia in maintaining the stability of southeastern Europe and the Mediterranean area. However, the true challenge to the Western policy towards Yugoslavia came in 1971-1972 when the political crisis, the so-called Croatian Spring, showed how fragile was the international, inter internal situation in Yugoslavia. This crisis also raised the real prospect of the Soviet intervention in Yugoslavia. The origins of the 1971-1972 politi political crisis date from the early 1960s, when the Communist Party split in two fractions, liberal and dogmatist or centralist. The liberals were supporting political reform and decentralization of federation, the strengthening of the self-management and the introduction of the market economy mechanism in the Yugoslav economy. The dogmatists advocated a strong central government and a state-controlled economy. Tito supported the liberal fraction, and in 1964, the Communist Party decided to begin with the economic and political reform. However, this liberalization, once initiated, could not be controlled by the center, and the issues which were until then suppressed could, not long, could no longer be ignored. Decentralization and the strengthening of the republics also contributed to the opening of the national question. In Croatia, which was in the forefront of the reform movement, a new generation of young liberal political leaders came into power in 1966-1968 with the support of Bakarić and Tito. However, by 1971, they pressed for even more radical reform, insisting on the further political decentralization, democratization, and more liberal economic policy. They reinforced their political platform by suggesting, by suggesting that Croatia was economically exploited through a centralized economic system. In their political struggle, they searched for the popular support which encouraged the Croatian national sentiment that was already growing in the Republic around Matica Hrvatska and the more radical student movement. The emerging mass movement and the Croatian political demands roused suspicion and unease within other republics, so the, especially in the conservative communist circles and the army. Tito therefore requested from the Croatian leadership to pacify the movement, and when they declined to follow his instruction, he decided to overthrow them. After the fall of the Croatian Spring, Yugoslavia entered into a period of enforced stabilization, during which the liberal communist leaderships in other Yugoslav republics were also removed, removed from power. The British foreign policy establishment was anxious about the internal situation in Yugoslavia in the early 1970s and the possible impact of this crisis uh, and which could have on the interne international position of the country. British ambassador in Belgrade, Timothy Garvey, in the diplomatic report from 1975, warned London that Britain should conduct a more proactive policy towards Yugoslavia. Quote, Yugoslavia's independence and survival is important to us because it propels an important corner of our world which will otherwise fall in. We support Yugoslav independence in the past with men and money. In, re in recent years, we have had it for free, but we shall not always be able to do so. We can get away with quite a modest contribution to, Yugoslav to Yugoslavia's stability, but our subscription is becoming overdue for renewal. In 1973, the British government prepared a document called The Implications of Possible Future Instability. This document assessed the possible threats to Yugoslavia in the post-Tito era. The Foreign Office anticipated several issues which could cause the instability in Yugoslavia. 
The serious economic problems and national disputes were recognized as the most serious threat which could provoke political tensions and disturbances in Yugoslavia. Also, the implementation, the implementation of the new constitution in 1974 would lead to a major conflict between the republics. Finally, British policymakers were afraid of the possible power struggle after Tito's death. Tito was at that time uh, 81 years old. So the main threat to the Yugoslavia position in the case of internal stability would be a possible so Soviet reaction to the crisis. The British officials considered that the Soviets would try to turn the situation to their advantage, either to attain a dec decisive influence or perhaps even control in Yugoslavia. The Soviet reaction to the possible instability in Yugoslavia would depend, in the British assessment, on the seriousness of the crisis. In the event of limited instability, the Soviets would uh, probably use pressure and inducements to influence events in their favor. In their opinion, the renewed Soviet Yugoslav economic and commercial leagues in 1971-1972, established under the terms favorable to the Yugoslav side, were signs of such Soviet strategy in Yugoslavia. However, if the Yugoslav crisis would become serious to the point where the country could appear to be breaking up, British policymakers believed that the Soviets would intervene, intervene militarily, although such a move would be faced with number, num, numerous difficulties. Nonetheless, the British government estimated that the Soviets would probably not tolerate the threat, of, the threat of prolonged instability in Yugoslavia, since this could spread to Eastern Europe, which would offer to Western powers an opportunity to exploit the situation. The British planners considered one more scenario, the gradual Finlandization of Yugoslavia. This possibility also raised concerns in the government circles, as this would represent an adverse change in the overall balance of power in Europe. The main objective of the British policy in Yugoslavia was therefore to maintain the in integrity, stability and prosperity of the country. Furthermore, the British government wanted to ensure that Yugoslavia remained non-aligned, but in a sense favorable to the West. British policymakers were aware that the West had limited options in assisting Yugoslavia. British policymakers, uh, it, it was also clear to them that Britain could not act unilaterally, but in cooperation with other Western allies. Since Anglo-American consultations did not create a joint policy agenda towards Yugoslavia, Britain, on the one hand, continued to develop close bilateral contacts with the Yugoslav government, and on the other hand, acted within the EEC to formulate a common policy towards Belgium. In fact, the British officials considered that Yugoslavia could become one of the European political cooperation case studies. Still, British policy policymakers were aware that without act American support, the community efforts would have limited success. The economic and financial assistance to Yugoslavia was, according to the Foreign Office assessment, the main field to which the Western powers could develop strong relations with Yugoslavia. In their view, this was also the best way to keep the country away from the Soviet Union. However, the commercial relations between Britain and Yugoslavia were continuously declining. The British share in the Yugoslavian market was falling, while at the same time, German and Italian economic activities in Yugoslavia were expanding. The Foreign Office officials were aware that without strong commercial relations, Britain could not play a prominent role in the Western policy towards Yugoslavia. In the words of Sir Douglas Stewart, Without greater, greater commercial and economic activity, quote, everything we do here will have an element of making bricks without straw, of trying to hold a position which is slipping away from us. End of quote. The, war, the Foreign Office recognized, however, that, Bra that Britain could have influence on Yugoslavia as a member state of the European community, since the country was becoming more and more dependent on the EEC for trade, tourism, and the remit remittance of expatriate workers. Thus, the British interest in the EEC opened the opportunity to British diplomacy in the early 1970s to enhance London's position towards Belgrade, as it could, for example, at that time advocate for more favorable terms of the trade agreement, which was re renegotiated between the EEC and Yugoslavia. Uh, at the end, uh, it seems reasonable to conclude uh, that Yugoslav trade case provides yet another argu argument to support the view that historians should interconnect the history of the European integration and the Cold War history. The recent historiography on the Western European reaction to the crisis in Southern Europe in the 1970s and the analysis of the British policy towards Yugoslavia in the early 1970s suggest that they apply, applied similar European instruments in Yugoslavia. In other words, towards Yugoslavia was determined by the Cold War dynamics. 
This co conclusion is supported by the fact that in the moments when it seemed that there was a real Soviet threat to Yugoslavia, the break spring in 1968, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, at, thi at these points, the EEC further deepened cooperation with Yugoslavia. However, although the Soviets had, and especially in the 1970s, an increased interest in Yugoslavia as a con consequence of their military and political e expansion in the Mediterranean, I would argue that the unstable political situation in Yugoslavia, which became evident after the political crisis in 1971, had perhaps even greater imp impact on the formulation of the community policy than the perceived Soviet threat. Thus, the policy of the Western European governments, and sub subsequently of the EEC, was motivated not only by the desire to preserve the Yugoslav non-aligned position in the Cold War confrontation, but moreover to maintain economic and consequently political stability of the country. And in order to achieve these goals, the community established close economic, trade and financial cooperation with Yugoslavia, as well as cooperation in other areas. Thank you. So, uh, what, what I will do now is, I am not going to be a proper discussant, I'm gonna maybe just uh, ask one question to each of the speakers. And uh, we would have, I think, 15 minutes for uh, our debate. And I would encourage you to intervene and to ask questions in every language that you feel uh, comfortable with, which means you can ask questions in Italian. Uh, and I can translate uh, even if I understand the question uh, to Ivan. Uh, and uh, let me just start myself and then if somebody else wants to step in the discussion, uh, feel free. Um, now, the paper by uh, Davide Denti uh, is kind of, um, let's say, half a paper, uh, sort of a political scientist, I would say, trying to theorize uh, EU enlargement uh, with uh, sort of uh, the, the effort also to, to write the history of the enlargement process. Obviously this is quite a risky business <laughs> because uh, to write the history of one enlargement one would need to write uh, ten books. Uh, so if you try to write the history of all the different enlargements uh, it's even harder. So maybe my suggestion would be sort of to focus on the the theoretical part because then there are risks uh, of... Uh, there is one sentence in particular that, that struck me and uh, uh, that on one sentence that made me think that you should go a bit deeper in the history of uh, you, the European integration process. But it, I think it's quite... Uh, it's, it could be interesting to, to have a debate on this sentence, if you, if you think. When you argue that the 1973 enlargement to the United Kingdom, Denmark and Ireland brought about a push towards liberal economic principles and the free market, away from the French dirigism. I, I could list you... 20 different reasons why this is not true. Uh, because in the 1970s, the UK was maybe one of the most state-centered uh, countries in the whole uh, uh, of Western Europe. Uh, and certainly it did not have a liberal uh, economic policy, at least within the country. Uh, but this is something we can debate. Th th there, because it's on the risk of... Uh, trying to explain uh, what happened after an enlargement process, uh, which is in a way interesting, and uh, the theories about it are challenging. Then when you go actually deep into what happened 
it's risky because you have to know the history of uh, 10, uh, 12 uh, different countries uh, in order to understand actually what, what, what was their own internal politics uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so what I would like to you from you is actually, if you can explain, as I know it's not easy, what is the theoretical approach you favor the most? That is the part I liked, sort of liberal intergovernmentalism social uh, constructivism, which are all things I don't know a lot about it, but if you explain us, according to you, what is the most convincing theory uh, from a political scientist's point of view, that it, if you want to explain the enlargement process, and then we can, if we want, also discuss about this. Uh, to Simone uh, Paoli, it may be the only question I would ask him is, uh, since you basically, if I'm not wrong, say <coughs> that the main purpose behind the Schengen Agreement from the point of view of the French and German government was to exclude uh, and sort of defend the European community from uh, migrants, mainly from the Mediterranean, let's say, but not only, if you actually can, uh, which is something I support, uh, but if you actually can prove this argument from documents you read whereby a French uh, politician uh, or uh, official actually says we are go doing this because we want less uh, Tunisians to come to, to, come to Europe. Uh, and the question to uh, Ivan is uh, convince me that the position of Britain is so important uh, in, the, in, the, in the relationship between uh, Yugoslavia uh, and Europe. It's just, it seemed to me that they, I mean, Britain comes into your paper, but I wasn't convinced that it's so important in specific to write about what Britain thinks of the, the situation in Yugoslavia. So if you had to convince me, what, what would you actually uh, say? Uh, let me just, these are the questions. Do you, does somebody else have questions so that they don't, if they start replying, maybe we, we have 10 minutes. Uh, David. Uh, well, a question for Ivan. Uh, what about the um, position of the Yugoslav leadership uh, about the uh, relations with the community? I mean, was there an homogeneous uh, point of view or there were divisions within the leadership? Okay. This is something which I would like to... Yeah. Uh, later. Just let's uh, take some <coughs> other questions if there are any. Um, my question is for Mr. Pauli. Um, I'm not sh quite sure it specifically relates to your paper, but maybe if you could explain, because you, you talked about um, migration from uh, outside of the uh, European Union, but I would maybe like to see also the perspective within the Union, so internal migration, um, especially in the last enlargement. So should there be like policies that also could contain um, member states from, as um, for example, UK and Ireland uh, and Sweden, sort of the church fronts uh, say, yeah, let's, let's implement a free movement, but others had this uh, transitory quotas. So should this be pursued more or not? Uh, okay, you understood the question because I had, I didn't... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I was like saying no. because we had... You understood, okay. Well, no, you are no, no, no. So. <laughs> 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 no, specify, specify by your question. No. You said that you, you are interested in, uh, in, in the internal in agreements policy. among uh, the countries. The member states, yes. The member states. Uh, okay. Somebody else, uh, whatever comes to your mind, uh, uh, something you didn't like about what they said. Well. I would start think about something, and I will start with okay. David. No, I definitely take the point about uh, the UK and liberal, economic liberalism in the 70s. 
and I understand that political scientists should not make the, uh, should not take the place of historians and vice versa. So yeah, it was a risky thing. I just thought that I had to put forward a few things about the process before beginning to tell us. But there are definitely many historians who did very well, who did it way better than me. So I don't want to. And um, what I was thinking about, which may probably then got into the paper, was the long-term uh, lock-in effect of the membership of some countries on some specific policies of the Union, so that we can see that the membership, for instance, of Nordic countries brought about the institutionalization of uh, environmental policies in the Union. The membership of Italy in the 50s brought about free movement of persons, so this is something which usually gets forgotten about. We, so it's not that much about how the UK was in the 70s, but what is the long-term impact of the membership of, of a specific country on the institutionalization of specific policies in the Union. And uh, for what concerns the second question, I would never dare to say which theory is right and which theory is wrong. Um, what, uh, and actually no theory can claim to be able to explain European integration alone though it may go, uh, it may be understood like that sometimes, but for instance I try to show how different theories explain different facets of a process which is multifaceted and which cannot be explained by one approach alone. If we take in liberal intergovernmentalism we can say what's going on to happen in accession negotiations, but we don't know why it happens, why was accession uh, offered in the first place, and we don't know why uh, it doesn't happen in other cases or um, why countries would like to see, for instance, just to take one of them and show uh, the good and the uh, bad points. Um, what I am convinced is that there needs to be some kind of eclecticism if we want to explain one specific round of enlargement or the process itself and we need to take into account both material and <coughs> ideational factors you know, to do that. So you're not pushing yourself to, to one of the theories? I'm not you buying any of them. Okay. I mean, to I think that it's most interesting probably today to delve a bit in the social constructivist field, but being wary that it's also, it, it has many limitations as well. So everybody knows what is a social constructivist theory here. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry if I didn't take the time to explain that. No, I was theory. curious because uh, I you know, uh, <laughs> 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 no, because I don't know it perfectly. So. Uh, Simone, uh, yes. Uh, the, the third question I want to answer is uh, the question of Giuliano. Uh, what are the, the, the happenings? What are the sources? Is, uh, I, I suppose you mean. Uh, I, I draw my conclusions for three sources essentially. Uh, one is the Mitterrand uh, documents uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, in the, in the French National Archives, uh, where you can find uh, the proof, the evidence, that uh, um, the government in Paris, and even uh, Mitterrand, especially in the, in the periods of cohabitation uh, at government, uh, were more interesting I, we're more interested in uh, uh, strengthening uh, external borders than uh, in relaxing internal uh, borders. In a sense, we can, we can say that uh, the abolition of internal borders uh, was a way uh, to make more popular the strengthening of external, uh, of external, uh, of, of external uh, borders. Another evidence is in the uh, documents of the Foreign Ministry of Italy in the Crux Archive where the officials of the Foreign Ministry are convinced that uh, this was a way, uh, of, uh, especially of France, to solve the immigration crisis in the 80s. According to the officials of the Foreign Ministry uh, in Italy, uh, Mitterrand, the government in Paris, were in difficulty in adopting restrictive measures at internal level, it was uh, easier uh, to adopt restrictive measures if these measures were uh, adopted at common, at common level. 
Another evidence, and I think it is the, the most important evidence, uh, is in the uh, documents of the Schengen uh, Committee uh, that I found in the archives of the European Union in Brussels. There you find uh, that this was the reason. For example, there was, um, when uh, <coughs> Germany, when Schäuble uh, decided to interrupt the negotiations, uh, the, the, the interior minister of, uh, of uh, the Netherlands said, OK, uh, we, we renounce to the abolition of internal control on persons, and uh, we adopt only the measures for defending uh, the, the external border controls. At that point, uh, the, the French uh, uh, interior minister said, uh, no, not because uh, the abolition of internal controls is the, is the condition for the abolition of, of for the strengthening of the external border controls, otherwise uh, our public opinion, especially organizations, uh, left parties, uh, will make us a lot of problems. Huh? Uh, in a sense, if you think to this, in a sense, uh, it was the same way in which the Schengen, uh, the Prodi government, now I, I go uh, to another uh, level, the Prodi, the Prodi government was... Don't get serious. <laughs> the Prodi government was, uh, I, I mean uh, the first uh, Prodi government, when uh, our, our current uh, President of the Republic was the interior minister, uh, Napolitano. The first uh, Prodi government was Schengen and Maastricht. Okay. Yeah, in, the, in the autobiography of uh, Napolitano, Napolitano said, our agenda was Schengen to join Schengen and to join Maastricht. And the euro and the immigration. And uh, even in that case, uh, the reason why, for example, uh, the Fondazione Comunista uh, accepted uh, the Turco Napolitano law that was a way to join uh, the Schengen Agreement was the fact that there was the abolition of internal border controls. Uh, it was, uh, on the one hand, okay, we will we, we'll strengthen, uh, we'll adopt restrictive uh, measures on immigration, but on the other hand, uh, we'll abolish internal border control. Just so one thing, but you said, uh, I don't know, if, is it true? Uh, there was no need before Schengen for a visa for a citizen from Tunisia or yeah. Morocco to come to Italy? Yeah, just... No visas? No, only, only, after, only after... There was, uh, in 1985, uh, there was uh, terrorist attacks on uh, the airport of Fiumicino in Rome. And for a while, for six months, uh, uh, the, the then uh, uh, interior minister was uh, Scalfaro, decided to reintroduce visas for citizens from uh, the Maghreb countries, but only for six months. Because in those six months, uh, uh, the Prime Minister in Tunisia especially, made a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the, uh, on the government in Rome, and the government in Rome decided to uh, abolish again visas on, uh, on Maghreb citizens. Because Maghreb citizens consider this, uh, this element as an important element. Huh? Even in the, in the perspective of the establishment of the Arab Maghreb Union, there was the aim of establishment a big free visa area, in which, in a sense, the citizens would freely move. Huh? I don't know if uh, it would be uh, the solution. Uh, okay, uh, you asked me about uh, other situation uh, and uh, uh, other situations, and uh, I, uh, I heard that you, you, you made mention to Sweden, for example. Sweden is, is a particular case because uh, uh, Sweden is, in a sense, the, the case of Sweden is similar to the case of Italy and Spain in a, in a, in a, in a sense. Spain wanted to preserve uh, its links with South American countries. Italy wanted to preserve its links with the Maghreb countries. Sweden wanted to preserve, uh, and particularly Denmark, with Scandinavian countries. For example, the reason why Denmark did not want <laughs> to join the Schengen area was that it wanted to preserve the Northern Passport Union. Because there was an accord between uh, Scandinavian countries for a passport free area, and the, the admission, the, the, the entrance into the Schengen Agreement could uh, undermine uh, this, uh, this, this accord. So, uh, I'm too long. Today. No, okay. no. Okay, for the, ah, okay. Uh, well, so the first question, why the position of Britain is important 
I think there are two levels of answers. First is the from the Yugoslav perspective, Yugoslavia and Britain in the late in the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, raised their relations to a higher level. They had a close uh, cooperation in different fields, um, selling of military equipment and so on. Especially in the early 1970s, Britain uh, conducted very active policy towards Yugoslavia because it was concerned for the stability of the country. So you had a number of high-level visits to Yugoslavia. So I think if you talk from, talk from the Yugoslav perspective, it's important. And when you talk from the European integration history perspective for the European community, I think for Yugoslavia and in general, but probably essentially is to understand the policy of the of France, Italy, Germany, and the United Kingdom as well from the 1970s. Uh, for me, it was interesting when I was reading the two documents from the <coughs> UK. It's basically from Britain and from the Foreign Office. Is that until late uh, until let's say early 1970s, you have um, there are different discussions about what are our possible policies towards Yugoslavia. Then in the early 1970s, you have uh, this. Um, possibility to pursue their policy towards Yugoslavia through the European community as they are becoming uh, the member of the uh, European community as they are already started to, I think, to participate in the, within the European political cooperation. And there you will find, well, maybe Yugoslavia could be, uh, and they are actually saying that within this forum. So I think it's a piece of the puzzle just to, you know, to have this com more complementary picture, comprehensive picture of um, as well, other member states which should definitely be exploited. But I think, uh, therefore, the UK is uh, also an important story. Regarding the positions of the Yugoslav leadership and the confrontation within the Yugoslav leadership, basically, I've stated that in the 1960s there were two fractions within the UK, uh, Communist Party. One was the dogmatist, uh, dogmatist uh, centralist uh, fraction, the other fraction was the liberal fraction. And basically, they had completely different view of the Yugoslav foreign policy and, and the foreign policy and the internal policy. And um, the fact that people supported the liberal fraction and then they decided to introduce the economic reform of 1965, it was, in my view, crucial for the Yugoslav policy towards the European community because they advocated for the liberalized state system, they wanted to integrate the Yugoslav economy with the, in the world market, and so on. So, Basically, the 1966 and the fall of Rankovic, I guess you know about this, was also one of the crucial crucial points when the dogmatist fraction was basically defeated. And then, again, later, but still, you will have to all, the, until the late 1980s, you will find, uh, this, I mean, confrontation, confrontation between these two sides. Because although they were defeated, you still have people who were advocating for this, for this kind of policy. So even uh, the recent book I mentioned uh, uh, from Milka Panin, she, she, she was uh, a president of the federal government in the 1980s. Also then, in the mid-1980s, they're again discussing this at the federal government about these two kind of policies. And she actually lost. And then um, you have uh, a little bit different economic policy pursued from 1985. So this, this would be my answer to your question. Okay, so since we started a bit later, we have five minutes left. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I open the. Let's see what happens. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it depends also from your questions. Forza ragazzi, dai, uh, Italian is accepted, I told you. And, uh, <laughs> well, I will ask one yes, to Mr. Yes. Pauli about the immigration policy today in Europe. And don't you think we need to change the approach? And like maybe to kind of renegotiate the Schengen agreement, especially because right now the weight of the new immigration way from like the Maghreb and the Middle East after all the Arab Spring, uh, just like the southern country are sustaining it, like Spain, Italy, and Greece. 
and especially given the fact that as a country we are not able, as we see, we can't like see, to sustain like uh, the capacity to sustain uh, this immigration, and especially because in the case of Greece, Greece might explode under the the weight of the immigration. And especially right now, the immigration is a kind of uh, working against European Union because on the on the wave of immigration are kind of surfing or all, all this xenophobic movement and euroscepticism as like golden <laughs> down in uh, Greece. And so maybe we need, especially to give more uh, kind of stress in the Euro Mediterranean agreement, and maybe create a kind of free this area or something like that, if you can. Yeah. Somebody else? Uh, to Mr. Denti, um, at a certain point you mentioned, um, uh, Otsi said, uh, imperfect process, uh, uh, referring to enlargement process, and uh, that uh, of course is a case-by-case -case, uh, process. Uh, and the enlargement of the uh, European Union and uh, of course there are several reasons that motivate this uh, differentiation but uh, in your opinion uh, what are the main reasons uh, from a European Union point of view uh, of this differentiation because for example when you said that I immediately th uh, thought about the uh, uh, Romania and Bulgarian case that enter a European Union, uh, let's see, so fast, and uh, on the other side, uh, Croatia, that uh, will enter in uh, uh, in two months in the European Union, but uh, after a very, very long and uh, also a stressful process. So, uh, in the European Union, which is the main realistic European Union point of view on that? Maybe one last question, if anybody has one, and then... Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, Ms. Bentes, you mentioned that there are some countries which were not willing to uh, access the European Union, but I was just wondering, um, did they change this approach over time? And are there some countries which didn't want to at the beginning and are now trying to get in? And if, are there any countries whose approach is just detaching from uh, the European Union, meaning not willing anymore to access, while uh, years ago it might be look like they had a positive approach towards it. Thank you. Then I'll leave it at that. And uh, please, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with the last question by saying that yes, definitely, some countries which started with a self-exclusion later. Uh, convince themselves of integrating it. And well, we can start by looking at Ireland, which is another case which people don't do, usually look at. Ireland at first saw mm, the continent as war ravaged, uh, while they were an island far away, uh, which didn't have the same um, problems, and so they didn't think in the 40s and well, the 50s they needed to integrate with continental countries. By the following 10 years, they shifted the perception of the uh, continent towards the one of a prosperous economic community. And they started to see it, to see the possibility of integrating with the communities also as a way of fostering their independence from the United Kingdom, to which they still felt quite dependent trade-wise. So there are, uh, well, one could say the same thing for Sweden, for Finland, there are other countries which actually had an exogenous change in conditions, take Finland and Austria, which allowed them to actually uh, pass from self-exclusion to integration because they didn't feel the threat of the Soviet Union anymore. Uh, different factors actually can explain why different countries pass from self-exclusion towards integration. Are uh, there also countries which go the other way around, which at first were more eager to, eager to integrate and today they would like to be more self excluded but one could argue that this is the process which is going on in the United Kingdom, but I would not want to delve more on this. Uh, 
uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely different factors explain uh, the process of change in different countries. Uh, for the second question, well, the quote was concerning the letter of a treaty, which is rather thin, rather uh, lacking details, and therefore considered an imperfect guide to enlargement because enlargement is a more um, substantial process. It needs more procedures than the treaty itself uh, provides. So it was through practice that procedures and a policy of enlargement was developed. The first rounds of enlargement were case by case, also because the demand for enlargement was limited. There were, there were only few countries which could, which could ask to accept to accept the communities. This changed substantially in the 90s with the Eastern enlargement, the prospects for the Eastern enlargement, where the number of the union was of the community was to double. This made it so that the case by case procedure that was used until then had to be reversed. And this led to the uh, creation of what was uh, then dubbed the new uh, method of uh, enlargement. And already in that process, there was differentiation in that countries were fostered to compete with each other for whom was to comply better in order to achieve to access the union before. But it ended up in a block accession. On the other side, the current process of accession is, as you said, uh, very dif differentiated and what is called a regatta approach, so that each single small ship of candidate countries goes towards the line of accession uh, by itself, which on the one side, on the one hand, has the pro, the pro of fostering competition, fostering compliance, etc., but also the reverse side of increasing tensions between candidate countries themselves. And I'd like to say also uh, one word on the question before, whether we should renegotiate Schengen. I would rather say that we should renegotiate Dublin II. Schengen deals with uh, uh, lack of border controls among uh, EU member countries. Dublin II deals with who is competent to uh, deal asylum requests. So if somebody arrives in Greece, and Greece is the first European countries they have uh, set foot on, Greece will have to deal with their asylum requests. But this is a rather this, this detached issue from the general migration issue. It's something which really goes on the newspapers, makes media fast, but it's something different. And this is what the European Court of Human Rights said. This is not consistent with human rights standards in Europe today so that European member states had to stop sending asylum seekers back to Greece while they were doing so, abiding by a regulation of the Schengen uh, acquis which was later communitarized. Yeah, mm, it's really difficult for, uh, for an historian to, to answer questions about uh, current, uh, current events. Uh, I can say that uh, at this moment in time uh, uh, there are two, uh, two levels of discussion uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Schengen group uh, at European level. The first one is about the aim of the immigration policy of the European Union. Uh, what we have to do in this, at this moment in time? Uh, many say that uh, uh, the immigration policy pursued uh, in the last uh, 30 years uh, Clamorous uh, failed mm? because the, the, the only uh, the only result uh, of uh, of this action is to create illegal immigration. But on the other hand, uh, especially France, but also Germany to a certain extent, uh, realize uh, that in a period of economic crisis, uh, uh, we have to pay attention to this to this issue. Uh, I'm not speaking, I'm not imagining about uh, uh, the recurrence, the return uh, of uh, the spectre of the 30s uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, or, in, uh, or in the United States. But it's obvious that in a period of economic crisis, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy uh, for politicians uh, uh, to use uh, the, the card of immigration uh, uh, to, to mask. The, 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 the real reasons uh, of, of the crisis. 
The other aspect uh, is about this so-called uh, burden sharing. And, and in a sense, I think that you made mention of this. Because what is the situation nowadays? Uh, the countries uh, on the periphery of Europe, the Mediterranean countries, uh, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, in a sense, uh, are at the border with the immigration countries. Huh? And uh, the core, the geopolitical core of Schengen and the European Union accuse these countries of not, uh, of not be, uh, being able to protect their borders. But the fact is that these countries pay the cost of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, control, of controlling borders without the assistance, without the economic, the financial assistance from the European countries, from the, 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 the European partners. And this is the request that constantly uh, Italy, Spain and Greece made to France and Germany. Okay, you accuse us of not being able to protect our country, so give us money to protect our borders. That is what Italy, for example, makes, for example, with Libya, giving money to protect borders. In that case, for uh, South Saharan uh, immigrants, in a sense, Italy wants that France uh, make the same. On the other hand, and this is one of the most important topics of the electoral of the election campaign made by Sarkozy, was that. Uh, there is, according to Sarkozy, the need to reform Schengen. In what sense? Introducing a sort of stability growth pact for uh, the Maastricht Treaty. In what, in what meaning? If you are not able to respect the conditions for staying in the Schengen, right. you, are, you have to go out from the Schengen Agreement. In another sense, if you, Italy, you are not able to defend your, uh, your frontiers, you have to go out from the Schengen Agreement because I, I cannot uh, pay in the cost of your inability to control your borders. So this is, these are the terms uh, of, uh, of the question. On the one hand, Italy has to, to pay for control. On the other hand, France says, if you are not able to, 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 to control, uh, you, you have to go, to, to go out of the Schengen Agreement. Thank you, then thank you all, and uh, we'll have a 15 minutes break and convene again in 15 minutes. Thank you.